But for all the brilliance of Barnes's club career, one criticism continually dogged him, that he couldn't or wouldn't reproduce his form in an England shirt. If this was true, no one had told the Brazilians. I can honestly say I cannot remember what I did in that game against Brazil. Even watching it on video, I try and put myself back in and say, well, yes, I got the ball from Mark Haley. And it's like having a bit of an out-of-body experience, that you know it's you doing it because it's you, and you must have done that, but to actually feel that you went past Junior, you did that, you can't, you, you really don't know. You know, so when people say, what were you feeling? And even looking at it again now and watching it, I still can't have any recollection of that. John Barnes made a rod for his own back by scoring that fantastic goal in the Maracanã. When he did that in the Maracanã, I wasn't surprised, but even now it's still a fantastic goal, isn't it? How do you ever live up to that again? Unless you can do that every week. On the way back, Barnes was abused by England fans. As they arrived back at Heathrow, the England squad seemed unconcerned about the National Front taunts which had been aimed at their two coloured players, Mark Chamberlain and John Barnes. Tell him we're all with you, I was a bit astonished to get it in, in international football, but I mean, you just going to have to put up with it. What I don't understand is how they're on the plane <laughs> and how, you know, they're following us all over the place. Obviously, they must have been funded by whoever is funding them, but that's the way, that's the way it was, you know. So to, to try and rationalise something that's irrational doesn't make sense at all. Although the focus of abuse from some English fans, it was Barnes who came very close to delivering England the biggest international prize. Most notably, the notorious World Cup quarter-final against Argentina in 1986. Maradona had put his side 1-0 up with a goal he infamously attributed to the hand of God. Looks as though he's going to be given his chance. Off comes Trevor Stephen. England needed inspiration to turn the game round. Comes one for John Barnes. Hard feels for offside. He wasn't. This is John Barnes. That's nicely done. That's a good cross. The curious goal. And John Barnes did what we know he can do. And English hopes are rekindled. Two to his left. One is John Barnes. And every Englishman surely will be saying, "Go on, run at them." It's a good cross. Yes. Just could not get to it. But time and again, when things started going badly for England, it would be John Barnes who bore the brunt of the fans' disapproval. John Barnes is being barracked, Trevor, by a section of the fans. When you put on a shirt and you play for your team, that's who you play for. So this whole theory about, well, if you're not born here, if you're not really British, you don't try, and the English players try harder, that is rubbish. Well, the booing's reverberating around the stadium, but here's a chance for Ferdinand. I think it's rather sad that John Barnes should be singled out. He hasn't had a good game, but then nor certain other members either. This whole thing about my allegiance to the West Indies, you know, I wasn't born here, I don't particularly want to play for England. So this, this was in the newspaper a couple of days before. So we play against San Marino, and we're only winning 1-0. So of course the crowd aren't happy, so they take their frustrations out. And the one who's not committed to England because he wanted West Indies to beat England at cricket. I played the whole game. Back into the park of Barnes. My goodness, he needs a goal here, Barnes. And I have to say, Graham Taylor was excellent because he didn't take me off. He, even if I deserved to have come off, he said he wouldn't have taken me off because that means that they would have won. And I thank him for that because I must admit at the time, I was probably thinking, yeah, I, I wanted him to take me off. Barnes, I haven't heard an England player cheered at Wembley for a long time like John Barnes has been here. That is probably when I felt my lowest playing for England. And that is the most apparent that the dressing room in terms of the management, in terms of the players, had been the most embarrassed I'd seen them, even the press. And up until that point, the press had been giving me a hell of a time. But even after we went in the press conference and went in with the press room, and even they were embarrassed by the whole situation. Why was he always the whipping boy when he played for England? Uh, and, and, and he got over 50 caps? How did he get over 50 caps? And people dismiss your England career or your international career as something that almost never happened. He was a great player. You know, I think had he been white, you know, there would have been very, very few question marks against his, uh, his ability to produce his best on a regular basis. When Barnes retired as a player in 1999, a connection from his Liverpool days encouraged him to continue as a football pioneer. I think the situation at Celtic was a very unique one. The only reason I got a job in football 
from a management point of view was because Kenny Dalgleish felt I could do the job. And I knew the problems that would happen in Scotland because Rangers were the dominant team at the time. Here's Billy Dodge and it's deflected in! And I really believe if we could keep Henrik Larsson fit, we have a chance. Well, this is Momo Silla, Henrik Larsson. Oh, brilliant by Henrik Larsson! He's a fantastic player, a good goal scorer. Henrik's attitude, his work rate, his willingness to try for the team really stands Henrik Larsson out above the majority of centre forwards. Petrov for the corner! Oh, yes! Henrik Larsson is the latest exceptional black player to have played in Scotland for one of Glasgow's two famous old firm clubs, Celtic and Rangers. Celtic's black revolution began with Gil Heron, father of the jazz funk guru Gil Scott Heron, who spent the 1951 season at the club. Heron was followed by Paul Elliott, who joined Celtic in 89 after a spell at Italian club Pisa. His old friend Mark Walters had joined arch-rivals Rangers the previous season. Both fell foul of sectarianism and race. The best thing about it is that, uh, you know, the people there that probably were talking about myself or Mark in a sort of negative way about, uh, about our colour, you know, in the end had to turn about, you know, they'd done it about turn because they had to give us respect as footballers and the contribution that we've made. Nice with a bit of footwork again by Mark Walters. He does that exceptionally well. I think through Celtic and Rangers and, 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 and both clubs having you know players from all race, colours and creeds. It's, it's, it's just some football now is a multicultural, multiracial situation now and I think that mentality now, as a, that negative mentality, is slowly on a decline. The adulation now conferred on Larson is evidence of the acceptance of black footballers there. To John Barnes, a black manager, attitudes were rather different. Things were going well in the first 12, 13 matches. It was a situation whereby I knew if we lose a couple of matches, that I'm going to be in trouble. Henry Glasson is there! Henry Glasson broke his leg, never played again for us, so I knew it was going to be difficult for us. Paducah! Oh! Baratchik! And so, so close! And it's Baratchik! He's hit the bar! My experience in Celtic was a, a unique one, whereas, you know, things didn't work out. I wouldn't like to say it's because of my colour, but I know that, you know, I suppose, Black managers here aren't given an opportunity or longer because of the stereotypes that they do have. Black players, we can now play, but can we think, can we manage, can we organise? That is, they're the barriers we have to break down. I think if John Barnes had been a success at Celtic, I think it would have started to rewrite another chapter. There have to be some role models there. Um, there has to be, you know, someone who forces his way to the front, as the first players did. You know, and then there will be no problem. I mean, it's very sad that we have to rest our progress on individuals' shoulders, but that seems to be the way it's been. A generation of black players were lost to professional football because of attitudes in the late 70s, early 80s, and they were told they had chip on the shoulder, so therefore they gave up. Maybe they didn't give up, they just weren't given an opportunity. I think a generation of black managers are going to be lost. As much as you say, oh, we're progressing and we're progressing, they ain't progressing. You know what I mean? It's as much as they want to make us progress. The real acceptance of black managers is something the English game is still to witness. But in the 1990s, the revolution for black players suddenly changed gear. The reason was a sea change in football, the creation of the Premiership. By comprising roughly a quarter of its players, the Premiership has provided a lucrative showcase for outstanding black talent from around the globe. Homegrown players like Andrew Cole, the winner of a golden boot and several English and European honours. And foreign stars like Ruud Hullet, a world and European footballer of the year and the only black manager ever to win a major trophy. French World Cup winner Marcel Desailly, who has contributed greatly to Chelsea's Cup wins. Thierry Henry, another French World Cup winner and a key part of Arsenal's League and Cup winning sides. And similarly, Patrick Vieira, who is also widely touted as the world's best midfielder. You've got a much greater role of the celebrity footballer now because they're earning such vast amounts of money. So they're, you know, they are the, the pop stars. They're, they're more than the pop stars now. They're, they are the 
cultural icons. It's right for Arsenal. And it's a goal for Arsenal. But in terms of influence, one black British star stood out. Ian Wright's career is inextricably linked with Arsenal, but it began at a different London club, just. By the time I came to Crystal Palace, I didn't even want the trial, because I said, no, I've got a decent job now, I don't want to be messed about. And so I went and played normally, and bang. Come through football the hard way, through the back door, so to speak, through Greenwich Borough, and, and having that sort of what I call an apprenticeship. So he's always had that desire and that hunger. Wright used that desire and hunger to help Crystal Palace win promotion to the first division in 1989. But the highlight of his six years at the club came in 1990. The FA Cup, to get through to the final, obviously, you know, I mean, just, that still for me is the, the highlight of my career personally. And what a moment it is for these Palace lads. The first time the club has been in the FA Cup final is something that you know. Everybody is, is watching. Crystal Palace, this is their finest hour, really, in the public eye. I remember one of my mates was in prison, and he was saying, my mate plays for Palace. And, and then they saw it, and he says, yeah, your mate ain't even playing, he's on the bench. Ian Wright, who, in the end, was a substitute. And then he said, yeah, but if he comes on, I'm, he would do something, I'm telling you. Ian Wright must now be gambled on by Steve Coppel. Ian Wright giving himself a chance here as the substitute to become an instant hero. I came on. Now here's Wright, his first chance to show what he can do. And he's through. It's Wright. Oh, what an impact by the substitute. It's 2-2. Two, two. And then the whole prison place was just coming over, giving him everything. Mars bar, cigarette, everything. Wright's friend was likely gorging himself by the end of the match. Wright! No! It's Ian Wright again! We scored it going in for a couple of Steve Cop was going out. He most probably was saying, Rah. Couple has made one of the great substitutions. Playing the FA Cup final at Wembley and to score two goals. This one was also, boy, you know what I mean? I feel like I've arrived now. Wright's two goals nearly won the cup for Palace, but they lost the replay and he moved on.